I guess any admirer of Baroque music would be positive about the claim that there is one indispensable ingredient to the recipe, which is this beautiful crunchiness that's just such a pleasure to listen to. And there's these situations where these crunchy bits even appear in lush accumulations. I give you an example. The thing is, if you leave the embellishment and the violence aside, you recognize that this fine music is drawn from a simple structural component, a constant succession of seconds resolving into thirds. And that's what this video is about. More on all that in a minute. <laughs> claim that Corelli didn't randomly stumble upon this thing, as it was a very common contrapuntal tool that actually is more versatile than you would expect. As a preferred gadget within a Baroque composer's toolbox, the 2-3 chain can be used in multiple situations and allows a lot of combinations with different bass lines below it. The simplest option obviously is just to put it above a dominant pedal point. It shows up several times in Pezzello's Partimento exercises and seems to be a standard procedure to prolong a cadential 5. Following the figures will directly lead into the chain of 2-3 suspensions in the upper voices. Sounds like this. And here is a famous outcomposed original example. This is as well a great example for how an Italian Baroque orchestra score is actually based on a plain trio structure. And now I'm gonna try to improvise a little prelude where my aim is not just to put a 2-3 chain onto a dominant pedal but as well onto the tonic. Anyway, let's just say as much 2-3 chain as possible. In the last part I maintained the 2-3 chain in the right hand when bending over into the Romanesca. That's because the Romanesca is as well a prominent standard situation of the 2-3 chain. It's a common procedure to embellish this simple Romanesca with different walking bass versions that potentially could accompany the 2-3 chain without disturbing the intact contrapuntal scaffolding. Here's an original example by Jean-François Dandrieu. There's even more baroque sequences that are based on this upper voice fabric. Here's two more examples by Corelli. And another one in the same key. What you just heard were two different versions of actually the same sequence. 
The first example showed nothing more than the plain scaffolding. In the second one Corelli picked up a very common standard embellishment of the same baseline. And now it's getting kinda confusing, as there is actually two similar looking but different versions of this base that could potentially be put below the 2-3 chain. The one on the bottom looks kind of the same but it's different as it produces chords of the 9th instead of 6-5 chords. The one with the 9th is obviously less common but I show you a pretty nice example that is kinda dubious as it's taken from a seemingly old German collection of versets, choral preludes and liturgic interludes that fell into my hands already a couple of years ago. The piece you're gonna hear is allegedly by Handel but I can't confirm for sure as I don't know any other source or edition that contains it. This example demonstrates that the 2-3 chain could possibly occur a 7-6 chain as well, which of course doesn't change much as the 7-6 chain is just an inversion of the 2-3 chain. So this one is actually the same as this one. But this one is definitely more comfortable for keyboard diminutions. You got the point. In another video I already showed you that the 2-3 chain can be part of several standard cadences. I'm gonna change it a little. A minor could now be confirmed with the same cadence. And I'm gonna give it a third grind. Some of you may recognize this bass line as it shows up in a popular little prelude by Sebastian. If you follow the two highest voices you'll recognize the 2-3 chain and once more this example proves that a diatonic scaffolding can be chromaticized. Believe it or not, the whole thing can as well be seen as a diminution type of a standard Romanesca bass. Sometimes this sequence is being labeled as sequence of the upper tetrachord, which describes it just perfectly, because as you can see, that's exactly what it actually is. Putting the first example by Corelli back on the table, we are now able to do a proper reverse engineering. The first compositional act was with high probability not sketching out the bass line, but more like stretching out the 2-3 chain in the upper voices, until it flows into the cadence that confirms F-sharp minor. The construction of the bass line now can be seen as a combinational mashup of small components of the shown standard situations, such as a bass clause in the final cadence, a Romanesca, the upper tetrachord of A major and the 3 down 2 up pattern. You can see that Baroque counterpoint is not just an art of combination. Corelli is a downright master of elision, which means the skilled overlapping of contrapuntal components and the smooth connection of pre-existing compositional building blocks. The final steps concern individualization, in other words, transforming this scaffolding into smaller note values. The final cadence becomes a double cadence this way. The upper voices undergo a standard procedure as all the stepwise motion gets embellished by changing notes or this kind of leaps. In case you already put your nose into such scores, you'll probably recognize that these are as well more or less pre-existing standard patterns. So in a certain sense, the process of creating Baroque music quite resembles the process of creating a Marvel movie. Well, not exactly, but I guess you got the point. Thanks for watching.